prove that uh, if uh, there is a subsequential limit of this UST Piana curve, so that's basically the <coughs> bless you curve which goes around the uniform spanning tree. <coughs> when this picture would be a curve like that. So uh, so we prove that if there is a subsequential limit of UST Piana curve and it is described by Lovni revolution, then it is a silly eight. So that's, that's actually the main part of the proof. And uh, essentially, uh, the big idea is that if you can show that one observable, if you can calculate one observable, yeah, you, uh, once something is described by linear evolution, you can get the driving force. Because you just draw the curve, you sample the driving force, and you get two moments of it. So what could be the possible problem? Uh, well, if you get some observable and the observable is not conformally invariant, then you cannot do it. But then, of course, the curve is not a silly because, uh, because the observable is not conformally invariant. Uh, now you can get some observable which is conformally invariant, and you can do this expansion trick and get trivial coefficients because observable is degenerate. For example, observable is constant 1, then you obviously don't get any information. So then it means that you just have, have to work harder or do, or do some tri tricks tricks with it, or uh, for example, our observables, they were functions of a point. So the, uh, one could have chosen a point, so the observable is trivial. So uh, if, if you remember what uh, basically we, we had this observable, which so we go from here to here, and it depended on two points. So if, for example, you choose two points which are exactly opposite each other, then you get trivial result. So if, are, if this is a conformal square, so it's conformally symmetric configuration. But if you move it a little bit, then you get non-trivial result, and everything is fine. So that's the main part, and we'll discuss it for other models. And that seems to be the sort of a bottleneck we don't know how to do for, for most other models. And uh, the reason we started with uniform spanning tree is that there the observable is probability of certain event which was known to Kirchhoff back 170 years ago. Uh, so it's, 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 it's a very old thing uh, to be calculated, and it is harmonic function, and every, everything is fine with it. So now um, what remains is that the sort of called a priori estimates, so in our case it's uh, a priori because uh, we want to have these estimates before we run the whole machine because we want to have this pre-compactness. In principle, one can first take the discrete curve uh, described by Lovner evolution. So discrete curve always can be described by Lovner evolution. So uh, uh, for example, in, in, in other models, it might be that the usual definition of the discrete curve is such that it touches itself, but you can always sort of uh, move it by one tenth of the lattice step, and then it doesn't touch itself. And the broken line can describe a Lovner evolution. So uh, then you describe a Lovner evolution, and you prove that driving force is close to Brownian motion. But then you have to do the same estimates, but uh, not a priori, maybe a posteriori. But uh, uh, you cannot really use what you did so far. So anyway, you, they have to be ready independently. So in this case, uh, what we prove is that uh, uh, basically the, this is the proposition that this UST uh, Piana curve curve. Uh, uh, so what is it? It is uh, for every lattice mesh. It's a curve, uh, let's say, denoted by gamma epsilon, some gamma epsilon for uh, lattice mesh epsilon. Uh, so it's a measure, so it's a random curve, so it gives a, gives a 
a measure mu epsilon on broken lines. So uh, the uh, three statements is that uh, there exists positive alpha uh, such that uh, this family of measures mu epsilon is precompact in the space of measures on the space of uh, Holder alpha curves. So by Holder alpha curve, I mean a curve with a given parameterization. And the parameterization is a Holder continuous function. So what I mean here is that uh, it's, uh, you can take this gamma epsilon curves for each of them. You choose some parameterization in some optimal sort of way. And that you give the measure on uh, Holder alpha space. And the family of measures is precompact. And then uh, also is that uh, uh, subsequential, if you have a precompact family of measures, then subsequential limits make sense. Subsequential limits can be described, uh, can be, well, almost surely described right, by Lovner evaluation subsequential limits, uh, let's say, of gamma epsilon can almost surely be described by Lovner evolution. So, uh, so basically, these measures are supported. Uh, so the, the second statement can be reformulated uh, uh, as, as that uh, new epsilon are supported on intersection of this space with curves which can be described by Lovner evolution. So we'll later describe what, what, that, what exactly are the conditions to check. Mm, OK, now um, uh, there is a, a general, uh, so I have a paper with an anti campion which sort of provides a general black box how to check one condition and then everything follows. Uh, now, uh, uh, the, and more, even better, uh, it seems, I mean, we don't have such a theorem, but in all the existing cases, this one condition can be checked if you have an observable. So you sample an observable and then you check this condition. So basically, this part, there is a black box which allows to deduce this whole part from the first thing. Unfortunately, the black box doesn't work for a silly eight. So it's the only case when it doesn't work because the curve is space filling. So it doesn't, uh, so it doesn't work for kappa big or equal than eight. So we'll do this by hands and anyway, we'll need, a, uh, well, this will sort of prove the main part of this black box. And uh, the, the main part in the observation is, is due, so it's a theorem due to uh, Michael Eisenman and Almut uh, Burchard. So they, uh, so that's that's uh, a theorem which which predates uh, a silly error. And Michael, uh, who is uh, who is a famous mathematical physicist, and uh, Almut was, I think, his postdoc at the time. So he just asked a question. Uh, do we believe that there are scaling limits of various things like UST or loop raised random walk or uh, percolation? And he wanted before doing the scaling limit because people had at the time very vague idea how to do it. So physicists had idea how to do it in terms of spin correlations, but not geometric ones. So he wanted to ask uh, whether geometric limits exist at all. Whether one, uh, so if, for example, one has precompactness, then there are subsequential limits, and where in business we can prove that the limit is unique. So it's, it's yeah, once, one, once again, so we prove that every subsequential limit is described by Lovner evolution, and uh, every subsequential limit is a silly eight. That means that there is a limit which is a silly eight. So that's, that's, that's the usual thing. So this implies that there is that limit gamma epsilon is a silly eight because we have this, this pre-compactness. So, uh, uh, and he, he observed, uh, I mean, the, 
best known random curve uh, is, is the Brownian motion. So Brownian motion is Hölder continuous. And it's a nice space because uh, as we teach in analysis course, uh, the space of continuous functions is not, uh, is not compact. Uh, so it's, it's not, not pre-compact. So it's, there are limits of continuous functions which converge uh, to non-continuous functions. So the usual setting, if you want in the space of continuous functions to get some limits, so in the space of curves, which is the same, is to get a uniform bound on continuity modulus. So this is Lipschitz or Hölder. So Hölder is, is a Lipschitz with fractional exponent. Yeah, so maybe if, if you have not seen, so the definition is that the, uh, the usual definition is the Hölder alpha norm of a function phi. So it's uh, Hölder alpha or just alpha norm. Uh, <coughs> so it's uh, uh, usually is written as L infinity norm of phi uh, plus the Hölder alpha exponent of phi. And the later is the supremum of phi of x minus phi of y over x minus y to the power alpha. So. Uh, much more common is Lipschitz norm where uh, so alpha equal one, it's called uh, Lipschitz. So Lipschitz is Hölder one space. So it's more common and sometimes people call this Lipschitz alpha spaces, uh, but more canonical is, is, is Hölder. So this is, uh, so uh, Hölder is, uh, uh, if you have a unit ball for Hölder functions, this gives you a bound on modulus of continuity and then it's compact among continuous functions, so we'll have convergent subsequences. Now, I want to immediately put a word of warning that uh, since we live in probability setting, we won't get that the norm is always smaller than one. Even we don't get that it's almost surely smaller than one. We get that the norm is smaller than one with probability 90%, smaller than 10 with probability 99, smaller than uh, 100 with probability 99.9, .9, and so on. So essentially, we get uh, exact uh, nice setting with compactness for 99% of our probability measure for any value of 99. And there is an easy statement, which is called usually Prokhorov theorem, that this is enough. Because what you do, you cut away uh, the one bit uh, percent of your measure for 99%. You choose converging subsequence. Then you, uh, out of this 1%, you take 99%. And then for this convergent subsequence, you choose sub subsequence where this 1% can, 99% of 1% converges. Then you take 99% of what is the rest, and then you do diagonal procedure of counter. So, so that, that, that we'll discuss a bit later. So, uh, the, uh, so this is all standard. So that what was new in their paper is, is how, how to get some further estimates. So let's, let, let, let me do. Um, mm, <coughs> mm. Uh, uh, let, let me do the theorem that uh, let's uh, mm, let mu, so what was notation mu, uh, give, give a random simple curve inside omega. So again, on a lattice, we don't really uh, care uh, about, uh, so let's say a remark. On a lattice, we don't really care because if we have curve which touches, we just do it like that. Uh, so what I actually need is not simple. The uh, thing which I really need is no uh, transversal, well, maybe I put transversal intersections. So I am uh, perfectly at peace with curves which touch themselves and bounce off, but I really don't want curve to do that. So this is, this is, this is bad. This, this we don't want. And the reason is that uh, when we describe curve by Lovner revolution, we look from outside and we look at the tip. And if in this picture what happens is that I look from outside, so I, I stand here in the complex plane or complex half plane, and I look and I see tip here. 
And it moves continuously when the curve is moved. So I see it. So it's basically like a ship very far away. I see it moves, moves, moves. But then if the curve traverses itself, suddenly it jumps to a different point on the horizon. Suddenly it reappears there. So it's, uh, uh, well, I mean, you can describe it with the Lovner evolution, but Lovner evolution would have then jumps. So the driving force for Lovner evolution, this W of T, which we want to be brown in motion, then would be, uh, well, in this particular case, it's not brown in motion, it's smooth, it would be smooth, but then suddenly it would jump to a different place. Uh, and, well, in principle, one, one can describe this curve with Lovner evolution, but it makes less sense. Uh, and it doesn't work that well because pro process process with jumps, they, they, they can be bad. So uh, we uh, don't want this uh, because uh, it won't work with Lovner revolution. Eisenman and Bush didn't want that because uh, they were speaking about uh, domain walks in the easing model, interfaces in percolation, loop arrays, random walks, UST perimeter curves. So all the curves they're speaking about they had this property, no transversal self-intersection. So they, it's basically some, some curve which is in the plane. So this is a small remark. Uh, OK, uh, now uh, denote, uh, let's uh, assume one condition that uh, probability probability that, uh, that for, so uh, uh, take uh, Take any annulus A R small R capital. So this is uh, uh, well, basically it's maybe Z R small R capital. So this is an annulus around point Z with two radii R small and R capital. And then probability that A uh, of Z R R is crossed k times. So then there is a uniform bound on that thing. So crossed k times, it means that our curve, uh, so for example, here it's crossed twice, well, thrice, four times, five times. So those are, by crossing, I mean that uh, there is a part of your curve which is between, between the opposite boundaries. So probability that it crossed k times is uh, bounded by some constant depending on k, and then the ratio of radii to some power. And the power I denoted by lambda of k. So assume we have this bound. Now there is, of course, a, a question why why we should assume something like that, why there should be a bound of this sort. Well, first of all, uh, it's clear that it should be some power of the ratio. Because uh, what happens if, for example, I stack together two NOI where ratio is two? So if, if here is uh, R over R is one half, and here also R over R is one half then the, for the big annulus, R over R is product of these two, so it's one quarter. So if I get some estimate like that for, for annoi, this, the main term should sort of telescope. It should multiply for different annoi, so it should be multiplicative, so it should be some power of, of the ratio of R and R, because it, it, it multiplies. Basically, uh, if, if uh, uh, you have, well, for example, three crossings, of the big annulus, it means that you have three crossings of the small one and three crossings of the bigger one. So the small one gives you estimate uh, r over r to some power, big one gives you estimate r over r to some power, then for the, uh, this thick annulus you also get the product of these two estimates. So it's sort of logical to expect if you demand some estimate it should, it should be some power and that's, that's in reality what what happens? And obviously, the power will depend depend on k because the bigger is the k, the bigger is the power because it's less likely you make several you you are to make several crossings. Now, well, the constant is in in, in front. Uh, this is actually a small problem uh, because uh, it's it's uh, for example for for percolation uh, uh, we expect that there is a bound. Well, essentially, well, roughly speaking, we expect that there is a bound where 
where there is no crossing, where you can concatenate to Anaway without losing anything in the process. So as, as I said, if, if you concatenate to estimate like that, there is a constant here, constant there. So you get constant squared. So it's, 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 it a bit messes up. Uh, and that, that we, we expect, actually, in many cases, that there is no constant there, that this is just term. And for example, for percolation, if you get estimate like that uh, without a constant, that uh, proves very strong forms of things like percolation cluster has dimension 91 over 48, stronger than what we know today. But, but we are missing a little bit. So in, in, in percolation, the correct estimate with the correct power, we, we, don't, uh, we don't have a nice control. But this, this is just a sort of detour, because here we don't really care about having, getting the correct power. We just get, care about getting some power estimate. OK, assume this. Then the, there are two conclusions. Uh, so uh, mm, let's say first conclusion. Uh, so if lambda of k is bigger than 2, then the family mu uh, the family mu or mu delta in our case uh, is precompact in the space M of Hölder alpha uh, for alpha and now uh, for any alpha smaller than lambda of k minus 2 over twice lambda of k. So we need lambda of k bigger than 2 because uh, then this thing is positive. So Hölder, may, yeah, Hölder alpha, by the way, it makes, sense, uh, it makes sense for alpha between 0 and 1. Uh, so uh, Hölder 0 doesn't make any sense because then you divide by power 0. So you just supreme phi of x minus phi of y, phi, and so it's just continuous function. So just an infinity functions. Uh, and uh, if you ask alpha b bigger than 1, then you get that the function is a constant because, uh, well, that just this will, this will be infinitesimally small. Uh, so what we get here, that once we get k big enough that lambda k is bigger than 2, uh, and usually for most nice families of curves, we, we hope that k increases with, lambda of k increases with k, and eventually we get it bigger than 2, then <laughs> we get a Hölder estimate. Mm, now, uh, mm, immediate hint why power 2 is good. Because uh, power 2, if, if you have, well, power bigger than 2. If you have uh, power 2, r squared is the area of a disk of radius r. So if you sum this, if you get power 2, and you start summing these probabilities for side channels, side channels, so I move a little bit uh, my inner circle while basically keeping in the same place the old circle. For each of them, the estimate would be r squared or even better. And they, they, they would sum to the sum of areas of these disks, which is finite. So we get finite sum of probabilities bounded, say, by 1. But I had an overkill. I had lambda k strictly bigger than 2. So we still have something to spare. So we get small probability of uh, this event happening in, in any annulus, not, not in a fixed one, but in any annulus. And then from that, we will proceed. So basically, that's, that's running a bit ahead. Why lambda k bigger than 2 is, will be fine, because then uh, this estimate will imply that k crossing event uh, doesn't occur anywhere or occurs somewhere with small probability. And the second, uh, <clears throat> yeah, OK, so that's the theorem. And uh, the second, uh, Part, so it's also due to them. Uh, so let me maybe erase this one. Mm. Uh, so for uh, oh, maybe no, no, we'll just let's 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 leave it like that. And then uh, so that's that's their theorem. And then uh, <coughs> there is a proposition which, uh, which also essentially they proved that uh, mm, uh, for UST, uh, lambda of k tends to infinity as k tends to infinity. So eventually, 
eventually we have this condition. And so that, that they proved. Uh, but moreover, mu is supported on Hölder alpha intersection with Lovni revolutions. So that's, so for UST everything is fine. Uh, by the way, uh, immediate, <laughs> immediate remark, uh, uh, lambda k, uh, so uh, you of course can ask a question, if we increase k, do we get better Hölder class in the end? Well, if lambda k tends to infinity, then what we, what we get here if lambda k tends to infinity, if lambda k is very large? Sorry? <laughs> One half. So we can get arbitrarily close to one half. Uh, and the uh, genesis of one half here is that uh, we're in two-dimensional plane. And essentially, any reasonable curve in two-dimensional plane has held in one half parameterization. So Brownian motion is not, well, Brownian motion is not a simple curve. So it's, uh, but uh, basically, any simple curve you draw on a plane will have held in one half parameterization in some sense. So it's, uh, uh, well, reasonable, yeah, reasonable is the key word. So it's, uh, uh, you, you, you can easily produce something which, it do, which does not, uh, it's just, uh, say, something like that, where you have more and more spikes and then passing to a limit. Uh, but, but one half has to do with the plane, and may, maybe uh, I'll introduce a, a, an exercise to that effect, yeah. Uh, yeah, by the, by the way, maybe let's, let's immediately do an exercise suppose that uh, uh, gamma is a Hölder alpha curve then Hausdorff dimension of gamma or Minkowski dimension or whatever other dimension you know is at most what uh, 1 over alpha So if we have Hölder one half curve, then its dimension at most two. And uh, basically what this exercise says that uh, you cannot uh, get Hölder two thirds for all the curves in the plane because Hölder two thirds curve have dimension almost no more than three halves. So for example, UST cannot be a Hölder two thirds curve. It can at best be Hölder one half. Uh, and also it sort of says that such, such estimate, uh, so they, 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 by the way, they actually, they also have a, um, they, they're, uh, so I would do it in the plane, but what they do applies to a d-dimensional space. So what they do, uh, you actually can do in d-dimensional space. If I recall correctly, two has been to cha change to the dimension of the space, yeah. So, uh, so this estimate in our case is, would, would give trivial answers because it will give estimate like, our curve has dimensions more than three, whereas it is in the plane. <laughs> but in some other ca cases, it, it might be useful. Uh, OK, so uh, what uh, we do, so I will do the next. So I, I, will, I will start uh, with the proof of, of, of the theorem. And um, uh, so the goal of today's lecture is basically to, uh, so we won't repeat a priori estimates for other models. The goal of today's lecture is with the example of uniform spanning tree to show that uh, uniform, uh, this, this sort of a priori estimates, it's kind of a trickery with counting cubes or balls or whatever. So it's a it's thing which is more or less a standard thing in geometric measure theory. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, so I, let's, uh, well, I will do, a few things. So let's fix a random curve. Well, fix a curve gamma. Let's let's first first uh, so fix a deterministic curve gamma. Fix a well deterministic. So it's just one curve. Uh, let's denote uh, for simplicity by a one over alpha. So, 
So it's that alpha which is there. Uh, denote M of gamma and L. So this is the uh, number of segments or curves, curves of uh, diameter L needed to cover gamma. So basically, you have a curve gamma, and you want to cover it by, by things of diameter at most L. So you start, and you cut, and you cut, and uh, well, here maybe the more optimal way is to cut like that. So some of these pieces can be straight, some be rather wiggly, but this is the number of pieces you need to cover. So it's, it's kind of an analog of dimension, or rather Hausdorff measure. And assume that uh, for this we have some estimate. So let's, let's say uh, an estimate of the type uh, uh, 1 over L to the power A, well, plus something small, let's say times M. And for simplicity, I'll denote this 1 over psi of L. Uh, then, so as, uh, assume that for any L, we have this bound. We have a power bound. So to cover curve by pieces of diameter 1, uh, you need uh, these pieces at most M. If diameter 1 tenth, you need at most 10 to the power A M pieces. Diameter 1 over 100, you need at most 100 to the power A times M pieces. So it's, uh, uh, and then, 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 then we'll, so we'll first prove this, uh, that this implies Hölder, and then we'll prove that this falls from our things. Then uh, what we get is that uh, uh, norm of gamma, so the, this Hölder norm of gamma, so Hölder, uh, let's say, uh, alpha minus epsilon uh, of, of gamma is at most some constant, depending obviously on all the th everything we have here. M, uh, ep, well, if, if it's alpha plus epsilon, well, M epsilon here. Uh, what else do we have? Do we have something else? Probably not. Well, if something else appears, I'll just leave this space. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you mean that there exists some parameterization? Yes, yes, yeah. So by this, I mean that, uh, uh, yeah, there is, then there is a parameterization such that, yeah. Uh, so we don't care when we draw curves in the plane uh, we don't care about parameterizations. And at times we use different parameterization. When, when we uh, prove that it's a Leibniz revolution, silly, we use parameterization by capacity. For, for this, for precompactness, we just use the best parameterization we can find with the smallest models of continuity. Uh, of course, I don't really care whether I get the very best. I just get that it's some, something bounded, some small number. Uh, and um, this, this is actually a, a thing which is related to uh, a very fashionable area now, uh, big data, and uh, working with large massives of data and finding some structure in it. So it's uh, so people uh, who do some numerical mathematics they often get uh, like a big massive of data. So they measure like for I don't know a million people, hundred parameters. They plot it in a hundred-dimensional space. This million points, and quite often you see that they are on a curve or on a surface, well with some mistakes. So they are around, and then you ask how you can best parameterize this curve or this surface. So usually it's a surface, but often some projections are curves. So, so this, this is actually a thing which people now are actively doing numerically. And it's a big part of science, how, how to actually generate an algorithm which does such parameterizations if, if you have, well, n n normally you have a bunch of points and then you just want to draw a curve over them. 
But uh, we are in, in an ideal situation, uh, so we, we just are given a curve, we want to parameterize it. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> what we do, uh, uh, we uh, Uh, let's say, uh, maybe, uh, you know, to be sure, yeah, I, I, I know what is missing. So uh, it's uh, the whole diameter of the curve is missing. So it's obviously will be slightly different estimates if curve has diameter one or diameter thousand. So what I do, let's split our curve in small pieces of some diameter, let's say one. So let's assume that uh, this estimate holds for, so let me just prove, put it here holds, holds uh, for uh, L smaller than, uh, let's say, U. And then, then this U also goes here. So basically, you assume that this counting estimates holds from one inch downwards. And then to do it, you split your curve in number of one inch pieces. And then you work with each separately. But, but that sort of change changes your thing. OK, so, uh, so the proof is the following. We take some parameterization, not important which, parameterization gamma of t. So T, uh, yeah. Now uh, for uh, L, let's say equal to two to the power minus n. So we want eventually to build a Hölder parameterization. So we want eventually to have some estimate on this Hölder number. It's enough to check it not for all x and y, but for dyadic x and y. It's enough to check it for x and y with difference one half, then difference one quarter, then difference one eighth, then difference one over 16. Uh, because first, if you have it for x with difference uh, one eighth and with difference one quarter, in between you get it from one eighth estimate just by adding things. Uh, and uh, so we'll see it later, but essentially, uh, we fix this dyadic ln because uh, we will first get this estimate only for dyadic things. So that's the first thing we, we fix. Uh, and uh, <coughs> so we take some parameterization uh, and uh, 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 let's say uh, we uh, take some parameterization gamma of t, and uh, uh, we, uh, uh, well, I just, I know I haven't erased. So we denote these moments uh, when we split, uh, so take some parameterization gamma t for L, uh, n equal to two, to 2 to the power minus n, uh, uh, cut into pieces of diameter at most uh, Ln. So the, those, those pieces, uh, we can think of them as gamma 0 T1, uh, gamma 0 T2, uh, T1, T2, uh, gamma T2, Tn, and so on. So the uh, diameter of individual piece gamma tk, tk plus 1 is no more than ln. And the <coughs> uh, total number of uh, pieces, so the, there is a final piece, let's say tn minus 1, tn, uh, and the n essentially is, is this, this number, so it's 1 over L to the power A. So 
So for simplicity, I drop m here all together. But uh, uh, what what you know, if if we have power slightly better than a, then eventually for large values uh, for small l, this will will be more important than m. So you can move m into this power, and. Uh, uh, if slightly smaller, and then uh, then then it is not important. So so you 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 can do this, and this is just changes again this this constant m. So you can think that there is no constant m, but just adjusting the power slightly. So we covered by pieces of small diameter, diameter smaller than l n. Number of pieces is is written in terms of in terms of n, and then. Uh, <coughs> mm, we start doing the parameterization after the break, yeah. So it's so the idea is that uh, we this is kind of a, uh, okay. So the idea is that we should reparameterize that these time intervals have the same length. We should reparameterize that this these time intervals are of equal length because the results are of equal diameter on that scale. But then on the next scale, we have to reparameterize again. And we'll just write a formula how to do it as a sum, summing a power series. OK, so let's, let's take a break. OK, so we uh, covered uh, our curve by uh, some big number of pieces. Uh, <coughs> So this is the estimate for the number of pieces of diameter Ln. And now we are, we are going to construct a reparameterization at this, this uh, scale. So we just uh, set uh, Fn to be uh, piecewise linear. Uh, which would send, uh, uh, let's say, uh, which would send uh, <coughs> uh, tk, uh, well, let's say just to k, yeah, we'll normalize later. And then it sends, so Tn, so the parameterization original was by interval 0, 1. Then it sends interval 0, 1 to interval uh, from 0 to, what's the total number? 0 to n. And then is equal to 1 over psi, so 1 over psi ln. So Fn is basically uh, tells us how parameterization should look on this scale. So the, because uh, then it covers all these arcs of essentially the same diameter by uh, maps them to intervals of length one. So essentially good parameterization should be inverse of the map Fn composed with gamma. Uh, and uh, what we do to construct the parameterization, we just uh, take Fn on every scale and then write a sum of those Fn's. So we'll uh, cheat our way out. I mean, the thing which is sort of self-inviting itself is that we do parameterization at a scale 1, then readjust at scale 1 over 10, then readjust at scale 1 over 100. That causes some problems, in particular because there might be, the curve might oscillate more in one bow than in another bow. And then we need more pieces of smaller size in this bow than in the other. So we'll have to, when we do scale 1 over 100, you might have to readjust the scales before. So that, that would be difficult. So instead, we write uh, <coughs> the following thing. So first we, uh, well, observe that, uh, observe uh, that, uh, so f, f was no more than 1 over psi. So, uh, Psi of ln times fn is almost at, always at most 1, well, at least 0. And then uh, set s of t to be the series sum of 1 over 
n squared psi of L n f n of t over the <coughs> sum of 1 over n squared psi of L n m of gamma L n. So the bottom thing, just by definition, uh, psi is the inverse of a. So we, we basically, why we have written this? So uh, we essentially added our, uh, these staircases we want to build in different scales. So it's, ba it's basically, we, we have, we have uh, well, it's, 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 it's like, you have this staircase and you add to it such staircase and then in the end you get the continuous reparameterization you want. Uh, and uh, we normalize by this because those are basically the maximal values. Uh, so Fn goes to 2m. Uh, but what we get since we took the coefficient which multiplied by, by Fn is no more than 1. So this product is 1. So this thing is no more than the sum of 1 over n squared which is, for example, no more than 2, because it's pi squared over 6, yeah. <coughs> so S of t is continuous. Uh, strictly increasing. Well, why strictly increasing? Because it's a sum of strictly increasing piecewise linear functions. Uh, why continuous? Because, uh, uh, well, you, it's just an exercise that uh, you sum functions with uh, bounded models of continuity with nice coefficients. Uh, and then it sends uh, uh, 0, 1 onto itself. So if you plug in 1, then here you just get the same m, so you get 1. So what, uh, what I claim is that uh, uh, gamma of t minus gamma of t prime is no more than s of t minus s of t prime to the power alpha. Uh, thus, uh, uh, gamma of s inverse uh, is a Hölder alpha parameterization. So this is this inequality is the same as saying that gamma s inverse of s uh, s well of whatever x minus gamma s inverse of x prime is no more than x minus x prime to the power alpha. So gamma is a Hölder alpha parameterization. And even with norm 1, but uh, obviously we got norm 1 because we split in sufficiently small pieces, so, so everything is, uh, is, is fine. It's, it's, uh, if you really deal with a big curve, uh, you would get norm bigger than one because there are these individual pieces and you also control it at a large scale. Or if, if normally in a normal curve large scale there will be not, not, not a good constant in France, so, so you get norm bigger than one. So it's, 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 there is no contradiction. We're not proving that every curve is Hölder with norm one. We are proving that when nice estimate holds, small pieces have Hölder norm one. Uh, okay, so why this is true? So indeed, Indeed, uh, let's, let's take two points. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, assume uh, gamma of t minus gamma of 
C prime is bigger than, for example, 2 to the power minus n. If it's bigger than 2 to the power minus n, then it means that uh, these two points, uh, well, let's say t and t prime, they would belong to different, different circles if we split in a smaller scale than scale n. So it, it means uh, uh, that uh, for um, <coughs> Uh, for k smaller than n, we can get fk of t prime minus fk of t at least one. And if this is true, then s of t prime minus s of t uh, is um, what it is. It is, by definition, this big sum. So it's sum of 1 over n squared psi of ln, and then we have to write uh, fn of t prime minus fn of t, and then we have the very same normalization. So first, the thing below is at most one half. So we can just write that this is at least something divided by two. So this, this two goes for this bottom thing. Now above, we only leave this coefficient k. So we only leave 1 over k squared psi of lk fk of t prime minus fk of t. Now, fk of t prime minus fk, well, uh, fk of t prime minus fk of t is, gives us 1. So we have these two things. But essentially, it, it holds for every k smaller than n. So we can just take k equal to n. Uh, well, strictly speaking, n from n minus 1 it holds. So it's uh, k equal to n minus 1, but I'll just put n. Uh, so it's, uh, well, let's say at least I will lose one, one more factor by changing k n to n minus 1. So we get this estimate, psi of ln. So it's 2 to the power minus n a over 4 n squared. Now, the only bad thing is here that uh, we don't want this term. Ah, no, but this, this, this term is actually smaller than 1. Yeah, so we, uh, uh, well, uh, let me see. So what do we want? Oh, yeah, we don't uh, want this term, but it's eaten by the denominator if, if uh, so I was careful enough to say that we, if we put power slightly bigger, then we can chop off a small piece of this power and it certainly it's a polynomial. So uh, what we get as a result is, is that uh, gamma t minus gamma t prime is, uh, <coughs> so, uh, so we assumed that it is 2 minus n, then the difference of s is this. Now we choose uh, 2 minus n, choose n such that they are basically comparable. So let's say choose, choose uh, here optimal n, optimal n, so that uh, the, this difference uh, and uh, we do this calculation, we get, we get this estimate, and we get that uh, gamma t minus gamma t prime is at most uh, 2 to the power minus n minus 1. 
And this is related to S of T prime minus S of T. Is it most as S of T prime minus S of T uh, to the power alpha. So we only, we only have to sort of cue this constant and we cue it by slightly adjusting alpha. So it's strictly speaking, you would have 4n squared and you have 2 from there. So you, you would have 2 4n squared to the power alpha, but this, this can be assimilated into exponential term by shifting exponents slightly if, if n is very big. So that is, is, a, is a Hölder parameterization. So what, what we did is essentially a big overkill, but we don't care because it's, it's like always like working with geometric progressions. Uh, Geometric progression sums to the same thing as its first term up to a constant, so this overkill only kills a constant. So once again, we've chosen a good parameterization at some scale, then we did it for dyadic scales, then we just added these functions, we got this staircase, and uh, there, is, there is a nice estimate, because if there is no estimate, it, uh, we get a contradiction by, by getting two points. So that's, that's, that's the main lemma. So the main lemma says that uh, uh, if uh, we have estimate of, of uh, number of covering pieces, then we are in business. Okay. Now uh, we need to get this estimate on number of covering pieces. Uh, from uh, so this 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 is uh, uh, lemma in Eisenman Burchard paper, but essentially people were doing this before and. Uh, uh, this is what I'm saying that people are doing in applied science also eff eff effectively by some computer algorithms. Now we have to check this for our curves. So the uh, lemma is the following. Uh, the next lemma is uh, suppose that um, mm, so for a while we, we still work with the curves which are deterministic. So for a while still uh, theorems are true, not almost surely, but, but always true. So if gamma has no k crossings, so crossings which go k times back and out of uh, uh, NOI uh, Z L uh, to the power 1 plus alpha L, so you take all the NOI of, of this type, where L is outer, L to the power 1 plus alpha is inner, and you disallow, uh, you disallow the crossings which go k times, uh, then, uh, uh, then yeah, it appears that you have this, uh, this parameterization. So uh, let me just think. I think I probably need not not alpha, but A here, it makes more sense. Uh, then the M of gamma and twice L is at most uh, uh, K times 1 over L to the power 2, 1 plus A. So there is, there is a nice bound. Yeah, maybe it was a bad idea to use the same A. Let's, let's, do, let's do B here. Plan B, plan B. Uh, so uh, here we'll use a trick. So, so essentially, well, one can do it in one step. One step, so one could do uh, one step that if uh, uh, you have no K crossings, then you can try to find the Hölder parameterization using that you visit every, every uh, well, you traverse every annulus a few times. But instead from this, we deduce that if there is this property, that uh, our curve by, can be covered by a small number of pieces of diameter L. And the idea is that uh, we will just go and chop off the pieces of diameter L in some specific way. And uh, if uh, 
uh, what will happen, we'll count them by covering everything by such anyway, and every such anyway only will produce k of them at most. So the total number will be bounded. So the proof goes like that. So we, uh, <coughs> we start, uh, bless you, with our usual parameterization. Uh, set uh, x1 to be gamma of 0. And set uh, xj plus 1 to be the exit of gamma from ball around xj of radius, uh, let's say, L. So basically, we start with a point, draw a ball of radius L. We go till we exit, draw a ball of radius L. We go till we exit. Draw a ball of radius L, we go till we exit, draw a ball of radius L, and so on. So this is how we generate our points. So this, uh, uh, this gives a 2L covering, because uh, each, piece, each, each piece we have is, is contained in a ball of radius L, so it is of diameter at most 2L. So uh, the uh, arc uh, xj, xj plus 1 uh, is contained in bxj of radius L, so has hence diameter, diameter at most to L. Now uh, let's count how many of those we have and we we'll have uh, <coughs> The two L covering by, let's say, by M arcs. Now, uh, each bow B uh, Z L one plus B contains at most K points X. Xj. Why? Uh, because uh, uh, otherwise uh, we take uh, uh, so just consider an n of z l one plus b l, and you get a contradiction because each each of these points. Uh, suppose that you go away and then you return before you get the next point. So to get here several points, you need to go away and return, go away and return. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually even uh, not more than k over 2. Even no more than k over 2 because each, each going away creates two crossings. So it's e e even k over 2. OK. Now. Uh, each ball contains at most k points xj. So we get that uh, uh, our m, which we want to estimate gamma to L, is, is, is at most, uh, <coughs> so this number m we got here, it's at most k times uh, the number, well, which is usually denoted n gamma L1 plus A, so it's a Minkowski dimension, so it's a uh, number of L1 plus A both needed to cover, needed to cover gamma. But since gamma is a two-dimensional object, you certainly just can cover not the gamma, but the whole plane by these balls. And if you cover the whole plane by these balls, so square one by one, where we leave you, you get it's no more than k, uh, one over L. So what was our proclaimed estimate? Yeah, well, 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 one over plus B, one over L to the power one plus B. So this is, uh, well, twice, twice one plus B. So we, we assume here that gamma is inside the box of size one. So if it's 
bigger than you also put have to put the size of this box. Okay. So, so far so good. So far we uh, show that if deterministic uh, curve uh, has no k crossing so far and for some case, and we don't mind whether it's k equals 7 or 17 or 700, then it admits a Hölder alpha parameterization. Now we uh, pass into probability realm uh, and we need to apply this probabilistically. Of course, our curve with small probability can do whatever it wishes. With probability zero, it can do absolutely whatever. And with small probability, it can uh, cross many, many, many times. Obviously, like UST curve, it's with small probability. If you have box 100 by 100, with very small probability, it will just go like that. So it's. Uh, uh, so the next lemma is uh, the probabilistic lemma, and that's, that's the last lemma before we finish the proof. Uh, so um, uh, now we, we, we so if uh, a lambda of k minus two times one plus a is bigger than zero, then some mm, over L equal to 2 minus N probability that no N knows A uh, L1 plus A L uh, has K crossings. Converges uniformly, uh, well, I mean, this is uh, uniform for different measures mu. So not only we prove that for particular measure mu this converges, we prove that for all measures mu it converges in the same way because we estimate it with these guys. And then I explain why this does, does the job. Uh, so, uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, you can ask. Uh, so, if if we again we live in a box one by one, how many? analysis of a fixed size I can draw in this box. Well, not infinite number. Uh, well, I mean, for practical purposes, you can, you can move the analysis continuous to infinite number. But for practical purposes, it's enough only to go dyadic. So it's enough to uh, sort of uh, draw anyway with the small overlaps. Because uh, essentially, if you have, for example, k crossings of this NOS, then there will be dyadic NOS, which is slightly different, which will also have k crossings. And you only sort of step aside. So essentially, uh, well, uh, proof. Can pass to dyadic, uh, dyadic NOLI. by just sort of moving a little bit uh, the size. But essentially, the main thing that uh, the total number of uh, A L1 plus A L in, uh, in, in a square is equal to 1 over L1 plus A squared. Because essentially, you, you just count how many circles of the radius L1 plus A you need to cover your square, it's exactly this number. And then you do, for example, 10 times more, 100 times more, so that they overlap severely. And then, of course, if there is a, uh, if there is, if you just do k crossings for this, it's basically the same as doing k crossing for everything up to this 10% error. So it's not, 
so it's let's say equal to 100 square this and then uh, so if k crossing in one of uh, in in some some annuals then k crossing in one of those if k crossing in some annuals a let's say uh, slightly smaller 9 10 well 11 10 l1 plus a 9 10 l then there will be k crossing in one of those so basically all n away is easily reduced to a fixed number of them. Okay. And now then what we get is that uh, the sum in question uh, is uh, estimated by the sum for n. The number of uh, n ways is this constant 100 squared 1 over L 1 plus A squared. And the uh, probability of our thing, it's, it's from, a previous, from a previous lemma, is uh, L to the power 1 plus A over L. So that's the ratio of radio of NOS to the power lambda K. And uh, L was equal to 2 to the power minus N. So this is up to a constant, 100 square sum. Now uh, what do we have here? We have uh, 2 to the power minus n, and the coefficient uh, with minus n will be what? So uh, uh, this will give us twice 1 plus a. Uh, uh, so it's minus twice. This will give us uh, uh, 1 of 1 over L A lambda K, uh, so uh, A lambda K. Uh, so we get, uh, do we get correctly? Yes, so we get A lambda K from the second thing minus twice 1 plus A. And if this is positive, then we get geometric progression, which sums. Okay, so that ends the proof of the lemma. And now I explain why we are done. So it's a proof of a theorem. So what we have proved then? Uh, so the uh, first statement says that uh, we have a Hölder parameterization if we have an estimate for number of balls needed to cover curve. Second statement says that if we have no k crossings anywhere, we have the estimate for this number. Or actually, it says that if you have no k crossings for small scale, then you have estimate for this with bad constants. So the smaller the scale, the worse is the constant. But and the third says that uh, the sum of probabilities of having bad NOI converges and uniformly in measures. Now, what does it mean that the series of probabilities converges? It means that we can go very far in this series so that the remainder has some one in a million. So it means that uh, up to probability one over a million, we have only a finite number of bad NOI, which are like one at scale one kilometer, one at scale one inch, two at scale one angstrom, and then nothing, for example. So up to probability one in a million, we can do the whole thing and do further parameterization with some constant which depends on this million. So basically, you play the usual trick. So we uh, take, uh, uh, so uh, for fix, fix epsilon, then uh, there is n, uh, well, there is n such that sum of this series for n bigger than n is more than epsilon. Then with probability bigger than 1 minus epsilon, no bad NOI 
at scales smaller than 2 to the power minus n. Which means by our lemma that there is a Hölder alpha where alpha is calculated by, by, by the formula before. Hölder alpha parametrization with norm which is constant of, of this number n. Because you see, we, if, if we just reduce to one of these small cubes, there are no bad boxes. And there we get Hölder parametrization with constant 1. But then we have to glue together 2 to the power n of them. So we lose something, but we lose, we lose some constant. Uh, so uh, uh, essentially, uh, that's, that's, that's it. Then uh, how do you do precompactness? Then there is the thing which is called uh, Prokhorov theorem. So this, this condition, uh, basically this condition, uh, is, is usually you call that this measure mu is tight. Or rather, uh, Hölder uh, norm of Hölder alpha norm of gamma is tight. So we don't prove that it's almost surely bounded. But we prove that with probability 1 minus epsilon is bounded by, by C of n. And n, n was a function of epsilon, so it's actually C of n. So it's C of n, which is C of epsilon. So this means, uh, so this tight means that, uh, uh, that with, uh, uh, with probability bigger than 1 minus epsilon, uh, Hölder alpha of gamma is smaller than constant of epsilon. So for every epsilon, we can find a bound. Now, if we chop away the bad curves, then we get Hölder continuous with a uniform estimate. And this is pre-compact. So, uh, so if uh, so Prokhorov theorem says that uh, tightness, tightness implies pre-compactness. But this is essentially not, uh, well, I mean, it's called theorem not because it's difficult to prove, but, but because it is important. Uh, and essentially, it's an exercise from functional analysis textbook. Because uh, what you do, you, uh, you chop, chop away, so fix, fix epsilon. Chop away, so suppose we have sequence measures mu, like mu j. Fix epsilon, chop away uh, bad part bad part. So we get uh, mu j epsilon. It's, it's a measure where you put away bad part of support. So this leaves on a uh, bow of radius c epsilon. Uh, so, uh, so the bow in the Hölder alpha space of uh, radius equal to c of epsilon. And this measures on such bow are pre because it's measures on uniformly continuous functions. So this uh, mu epsilon j is pre-compact. So it's measures on uniformly continuous functions. So it's Arcelas quality theorem that uniformly continuous functions fall from pre-compact family. And then, uh, if it's pre-compact, there is, there is, let me maybe move it here. There is a converging, converging subsequence. Now, what we do, we take uh, decrease, decrease, epsilon. Uh, so epsilon, let's say epsilon over 2. Again, do the same thing, chop off the bad part, take converging subsequence. sequence. Converging sub, sub, no, sub, sub sequence, yeah. So repeat this procedure, we have converging subsequence, converging sub, sub sequence, etc. And then we do the counter diagonal. So uh, take the counter 
diagonal. So here we had converging subsequence, which was, let's say, code uh, uh, mu j1. Here we have mu j2. Take the counter diagonal mu j j. And it converges when you chop off epsilon part of the measure, epsilon one half part of the measure, epsilon one quarter. So essentially it converges. So it, uh, up to arbitrary small thing, it converges. So it's, so that's, that's, that's the end of the proof. Okay, that's, that's the end. So we have proved that uh, uh, there is a almost surely Hölder parameterization if we have this no k crossing property, if we have some exponent which is bigger than two. Now we have to check uh, what happens uh, for the uniform spanning tree. Uh, so let's say uh, it's a proof of proposition. So let's estimate lambda k for, for the uniform spanning tree. So we want to estimate, so we have this, our domain omega where we run the thing, we have an anus, and we want to estimate that our tree has several branches. So how uh, one, uh, well, it's, it's more or less the same as, uh, well, our, Let's, let's say, so we want to uh, estimate that our perimeter curve has these uh, things. Well, they might be, look slightly differently, so they might look like that. So we want to estimate that our perimeter curve ma ma made a few entrances, but uh, basically if it made this number of entrances, it means that the uniform spanning tree has uh, some number of crossings which is related by a factor of two. Yeah, so it's, uh, so k, two k crossings, crossings by piano curve is the same as k crossings by branches, <coughs> by branches of UST. By the way, uh, Eisenman and Burchard, they, they prove slightly better theorem than just for curves. They also say that the whole UST can be parameterized by, has a Hölder parameterization. So you can take a bunch of intervals, each of them will parameterize different branch, and the sum of lengths of these intervals is one, and they will parameterize all branches, and the Hölder normal will be small. So they actually do a slightly better job. So, so here, for example, in this picture, what we have, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight crossings by Pian and four crossings by uniform spanning tree. Now, uh, how to evaluate the probability of UST crossing? So probability of uh, UST crossing, basically uh, from the, can be evaluated, so it's what, it's a probability that UST in a bigger domain will have this thing. So you can bound it. Uh, okay, let, let me push the accelerator pedal. So it's, uh, it can be bounded by, for example, by Wilson's SAW algorithm. So it, we can bound it by a harmonic observable we did. Uh, also, you, 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 you can bound, uh, for example, these passings we can bound, so it's actually also doable with the harmonic observable, but with, with, with some work. But by Wilson's algorithm, it uh, uh, can be bound by probability that loop erased random walk strikes this thing. So by Wilson, well, let's say if you have, for example, k things like that, by Wilson algorithm, it will be at most probability that uh, the loop erased random walk strikes the middle to the power k. Because what you do in Wilson algorithm, you run one loop erased random walk, then you run another, and so on until you create. And of course, this is a very crude estimate because once you uh, once you run the first one, it creates abstraction for the next one to hit the center, so it becomes more and more 
th difficult. And this is at most the probability, the same probability for the random walk. And this is basically a harmonic measure of the middle thing. So this can be bound by r over r to the power k. So this is, this is a very, very crude estimate. Mm, let me just do like that, because there always will be one branch. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Why, why do like that? Because uh, uh, you, you have to start with something. And what we start with, we start with a point here, and we will do something uh, to uh, away. And then we have k minus 1 branches, too, because one branch you always have with probability 1. But then adding each additional branch is uh, bounded by harmonic measure. And it's bounded by so this probability. And the probability, it's uh, already in a disk with a slit. And that, that, that you can bound by this one. Uh, let me think to the power. Uh, yeah, let's, let me do like that, to be honest. So I'll be completely honest. What is the answer? So this, this is just uh, because uh, uh, if, if, if you have, if you have uh, if you start random walk in a domain with a slit, probability of hitting the central disk is at most square root of its radius. So this, this estimate, maybe we'll do it next time. OK. So, so this is an example. You, you, you can do it yourself, because there are several methods how to check uh, that there are no k arms for, for UST. And obviously, from this, it follows that if k is large enough, the exponent is bigger than 2. So, if, uh, so this implies that if k large, then lambda of k is bigger than 2. Now, uh, what we have to check is that uh, uh, there are Lovner evolution properties that you can always describe this by Lovner evolution. Uh, so now the plan is that next lecture is on Monday. Uh, I will uh, say why UST can be described by Lovner evolution. And also, I will write an observable for loop erased random walk. Uh, on one hand, loop erased random walk can be deduced from UST because it's a branch of UST. If we showed converse of UST, we can deduce loop erased random walk. But it also has a very simple observable, uh, so that, that, that we'll discuss on Monday. Then there will be some exercises, and then there we're missing two Fridays because of Easter. So then the next thing will be. Uh, Three weeks from now, because Easter holidays, they kick out to Fridays. OK. So next lecture Monday, we'll finish this. We'll do loop Easter and the walk. And then the next lecture after that is after Easter on <coughs> Friday. Yeah. And it, I think it's better not to do Monday, because, uh, because there will be this planner maps lecture. So it's, otherwise, it will be too much. OK. Thanks.